Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Anthony Hobley. I'm the co-executive director of the Mission Possible Partnership and an executive fellow at the World Economic Forum. On behalf of both the World Economic Forum and the Mission Possible Partnership, I would like to welcome everyone to this virtual fireside chat uh, with industry leaders on Net Zero Steel. This Net Zero Steel session is part of the climate breakthroughs, the road to COP26 um, and beyond, that the forum is proud to co-host with the COP26 high-level climate champions, um, the COP26 president um, and our mission possible partners. The race to the zero breakthroughs is a campaign launched at the Davos Agenda in 2021 um, in January. Um, by the high-level champions for climate action, and it provides a comprehensive, detailed and actionable roadmap for achieving net zero through wholesale systems change, actually something Nigel Topping and I discussed on video earlier this week. But across nearly 30 wholesale sectors uh, of the global economy, um, now six months from COP26, this Climate Breakthroughs event is going to explore what true transformational change looks like during this meeting, we will focus on steel, and I really do encourage you to join the sessions on hydrogen and shipping later, where we will look at this same issue from different perspectives. I'm pleased to introduce Nigel Topping, uh, a good friend um, and longtime companion on this journey, um, our high-level uh, climate action champion uh, for the COP26 negotiations, um, who I invite to share his opening remarks um, and kick off this meeting. Over to you, Nigel. It's delighted to be joining um, the, the, the session with you and, 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 and the panellists. I, and I'm really looking forward to, um, to learning from the panellists and, and, in fact, for this whole day being about how do we um, reach these race to zero breakthroughs. Um, I, I think that it's it, you talked about being a fellow traveller or companion. I think this is one of the exciting things here is that we're learning how to um, do industrial transformation with a combination of collaboration and competition. And, and, and so the, the whole idea of the Race to Zero is to bring together this growing ecosystem of the most important companies, cities, investors, banks, um, and think tanks and civil society with this single unifying goal to implement the um, top level of ambition of the Paris Agreement, getting to zero in the 40s, but halving collectively by 2030 as the science demands. We, 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 we seem to have really passed the tipping point in terms of agreement that we need scientifically rigorous net zero commitments. And I think the Mission Possible Partnership um, and, and, and the UN Climate Action Pathways together are really helping to translate those near-term actions into specific pathways and that's the that's the, that's uh, i'm sure we're going to hear about that from the the, the the companies in the panel today i think the, the the thing that we're trying to do is as you say accelerate these tipping points um and so what we've tried to do is define these breakthroughs um as um, if you like intermediate systemic goals which i think for serve three functions they help magnify the impact of individual actions when individual actors can demonstrate that they're Per, that their individual pathway is aligned with those collective tipping points. I think they also help drive this radical collaboration that, that, that we've talked about so much. And I think that the Mission Possible platform, and with all of them, the, the, the partners and all the different collaborations by sector and the hundreds of companies involved really um, embodies. And, and then thirdly, they really allow us to focus on the, the near term. And when we, we all know that it's easy to say what five CEOs down the road are going to deliver in 2050. It's much harder and more meaningful and necessary to say, what are we going to do in the next five and 10 years? How are we allocating CapEx now? What are our innovation, um, uh, what are we focusing on from an innovation point of view? Um, so um, I'm also delighted that today we're, we're, we're updating the, the climate action pathways for industry, which have been collated by the UN um, Marrakesh partnership, which includes all of these collab collaborations. So it's not original research, it's pulling together the best and really trying to converge um, i think we're now able to increasingly show how actors from within and across systems can play their part in accelerating particularly across these the, the, the heavy industry sectors that you're you, you know that you're working on um ever since the that, that, the great first report um that faustine and team pulled together um at the energy transitions commission um i think the really exciting thing is now is that we see momentum building you know i talk all the time about exponential change the nature of industrial transformations we have over 71 percent of global economy covered by net zero commitments um 
And we're, we're seeing, um, I think we can say we passed an inflection point there. Uh, for me, the interesting thing, of course, is that it's not just about the steel industry, but the steel industry is, plays this crucial role in the global economy. It's about the, the supply side, you know, with um, we see a lot of um, moves towards net zero in the, in the built environment, which, of course, is a big, I think it's the number one user of steel and in the automotive sector. Um, I remember, um, you know, a few years ago working with Mercedes and they made their net zero 2039 commitment and one of the conversations in the company immediately was oh so that means we're gonna to have to buy net zero steel by 2039 um so it'd be interesting to hear from the panel about how those how that combination of policy um supply side innovation demand side pull um and and finance all interconnect and of course you know just a few weeks ago with mark carney we launched the um this massive coalition on finance the glasgow financial alliance for net zero that's the race to zero club for finance, 160 firms so far with $70 trillion of assets. So really key to see how these all play out with this, this crucial industry that's the heart of the world economy, the most, I know it's the most widely used material. I, I, um, I, I bought quite a lot of steel when I was working in the um, automotive industry, making brake pads, 40% of the components were steel based. Um, uh, but of course we know this is a huge challenge because at the moment steel making is one of the, the, the biggest emitters of CO, CO2. So we can say that's really hard or we can say this is exciting because it's a challenge that requires reimagining the science of steel making and i know that's what um you're all doing so we're going to need to rely on some really interesting breakthroughs in things like renewable hydrogen and i and i know um that we have a panel later today um about hydrogen um we're also going to need more collaboration across value chains and across industry um we we really thrilled to see that already there's more than 15 low carbon carbon steel projects planned by 2030 and in, in, the breakthrough that we set was to see at least 20 commercial scale facilities up and running by 2030 so it'd be great to hear more about that um we of course need to, to be able to get to glasgow and tell the story to the world not just that we've agreed on the pathway but that action is in place capital is flowing um, so, um, and we need to hear what more do other members of that system, what the policymakers need to do to provide the supportive frameworks, um, what do suppliers need to do to retool their factories and what can buyers do to help on the, on the demand side. So I'm, I'm really delighted that we're going to be hearing from Aditya Mittal from ArcelorMittal on the role of producers and from Elizabeth Pinton from Shell on the importance of cross-sectoral collaboration. I know Shell will be putting a lot of focus on that. How do you collaborate on the demand side? Um, so, Anthony, thank you so much for inviting me. Really keen to see what we can unlock in this conversation. Um, and let me hand back to you to, to run the panel. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nigel. And if, if you want to know more about Nigel and, and my thoughts and you know our discussion on systems change, check out the video we did together and the blog, uh, which is on the forum website and the Mission Possible Partnership website. Um, now I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce the moderator of today's uh, meeting, Faustine Dallasal, uh, the director at the Energy Transitions Commission, and I'm delighted, even more delighted to say, my co-executive director of the Mission Possible Partnership. Um, I think we like to think of ourselves as the, the dream team. Um, Faustine is also leading the Mission Possible Partnership's Net Zero Steel uh, initiative, and is therefore the absolutely the ideal person to guide the following conversation. Faustine, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and it's a ple pleasure to welcome to this fireside chat uh, Aditya Mittal, the Chief Executive Officer of ArcelorMittal, and Elizabeth Brinton, uh, who is the uh, Executive Vice President for Renewables and Energy Solutions at Shell. So I'm really looking forward to the next half an hour or so. Uh, as you probably know if you've followed uh, past sessions, there is a slow going place for you to ask questions as we go through the discussion today. We might not get to all questions that you've asked through Slido, uh, but we'll do our best to pick up on some key themes. Uh, and your questions also feed into the work that we're doing with the Mission Possible Partnership uh, ahead of COP26. Nigel has already introduced the topic uh, today uh, very well, so I'll be very brief. Uh, as we all know, uh, steel represents uh, seven to eight percent of global emissions from the energy system today and we need to bring that to net zero by uh, mid-century to be in line with uh, an IPCC 1.5 scenario. The technologies to do that are on the horizon both in terms of 
uh, increasing uh, the use of scrap through recycling steel, but also through the deployment of new zero carbon uh, production technologies for all days, uh, primary steel production. Um, but we have a challenge of pace. Uh, if those technologies are going to be deployed at scale, given the lifetime of steel assets, we need those technologies to be brought to market and to be as cheap as possible uh, before 2030. So the next decade is absolutely crucial if we want to unlock change in the steel sector. And uh, that's why we've set up the Nature Steel Initiative to really try to unlock value chain collaboration to make it happen. Because as Nigel was saying earlier, our strong belief is that it takes a full value chain to decarbonize the hard to abate sector. It takes collaboration between the steel manufacturers and their environments, their energy providers, their buyers, their finance players, but also governments to really uh, create a favorable environment for investment. Uh, and that's uh, the discussion that I want to have today with Aditya and Elizabeth, is to better understand how do we make that magic happen over the next uh, few years. So I'll turn to you first, uh, Aditya. Uh, thanks again for being with us today. You lead one of the biggest steel producers worldwide. Um, ArcelorMittal has made very ambitious commitments for 2050, but also for 2030. My initial question to you is, how are you going to achieve those goals that you've set out for your company. What's your role in that transition and what help do you expect from players around you in your value chain? Fantastic. So uh, good morning, everyone uh, who's joining us. And thank you, Faustine. Thank you, Nigel, for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you to the WEF for organizing this. I'm actually very thrilled to be part of this panel because I'm very excited about the prospects of net zero steel. Uh, I think Faustine talked about it, Nigel alluded to, the bad news is that steel is responsible for 7 to 8% of global emissions. So it's a huge issue when you look at the whole uh, climate change discussion. Uh, I think the good news, maybe the okay news, is that even in spite of being uh, responsible for 7 to 8% of global emissions, it is a material of choice because it has the lowest carbon footprint of any other material today. So we're starting with relative low carbon footprint, multiple times lower than aluminium or other carbon-based materials. It's infinitely recyclable. So when you look at plastics, what plastics want to do in 20 years, steel can do today. So you're starting with a good base. And I think the really good news, and I think that's where we're having this panel, is that we have the pathway to net zero steel. Right? And I think Faustine mentioned that there are technology solutions. Uh, I think fundamentally there are three pathways. The first is a direct reduced iron, which is natural gas based today. So instead of using coal, you use natural gas. You can now substitute that uh, with hydrogen. We have a pilot facility in Hamburg actually, where we're experimenting with hydrogen in DRI. And obviously that dramatically reduces the carbon footprint we can also deploy uh, CCU uh, technologies where we can capture the carbon, convert it into advanced biofuels. Uh, we have a project in Belgium uh, where we're doing that and we can produce advanced biofuels. Uh, and then obviously uh, the R&D project and, and not for this decade is direct ele electrolysis. So I'll keep direct ele electrolysis discussion to the side because I think just with DRI natural gas or DRI hydrogen uh, and with CCU, we can achieve uh, net zero steel. The other positive is uh, the market. So I know Nigel talked about Daimler and when he worked with uh, brake pad manufacturers. So if you were there at those companies today, they would tell them that ArcelorMittal actually can supply them certified uh, green steel, which has a carbon footprint of zero. So scope three uh, emissions of zero. Uh, we're the first steel company to do that. And we, we launched it. We, we, we thought we'd ask the market and see what the response is. And the response has been tremendous. So every customer wants, uh, wants some of it. Uh, we are sold out, which is great. We have more, uh, more product coming in uh, next year. But what is interesting is when we, we German market is they're talking to their own customers and trying to get a sense because we're a little bit of an issue. Our customers are to meet, right? So the warehouse manufacturer wants to go to the e-tailers e and understand, do we want now green warehouses? If they sell it, if we sell it to an automotive, uh, how much will a customer pay for a green car? So 
that's also very positive. Uh, I think in terms of ecosystem, uh, we have Shell on the panel, they are a market leader, and we have good collaboration on how we can use hydrogen or other uh, or electricity to continue to, to decarbonize. The area which is lacking uh, is the level playing field or the regulatory environment. So we have the technology capability, very excited by the market prospects. I think there's a good ecosystem of industry and other participants coming together to find a holistic solution. But our concern is that if there's no level playing field, what do we do with all of these ideas and technology solutions? Because if we implement it, increase our capex cost and opex cost and then we get undercut by other producers where there there's no cost of co2 and their emissions are actually higher than ours today then we we're just hollowing out the european steel industry or the developed world steel industry so for us we can accelerate we can go very fast we actually have lots of plans uh, uh, not only in Europe, but also in North America to decarbonize our, our process at remarkable speed, germinated the market. But what we need is regulatory support to, to make us uh, fund that transition in an economic basis. So, so I, think, uh, I think we will get there uh, based on the discussions we're having with various governments. Uh, I, see, uh, I see a lot of appetite. The other small thing I will put in this, and maybe it's a lot of information, but I think worth putting out there, is that the cost to decarbonize steel is much cheaper than the cost to decarbonize any other sector, or at least we looked at a few sectors, so transportation, chemicals, plastics, because for 150 million or 300 million, depending on which geography it is, you can permanently reduce 1 million ton of CO2 emissions. And so when we talk to government, they get very excited by that because the amount of capital that's going into transportation is a multiple of that. A renewable sector is still a multiple of that. So there is an appetite to achieve this at not crazy cost levels, at reasonable cost levels. And so I do think that eventually we will make the regulatory uh, balance or achieve the regulatory balance, which will allow us to decarbonize. So very excited. I, I think we're on the right path, but clearly to accelerate, we need more support. Thanks a lot, Aditya. And there's a lot to unpack in what you've just said. Uh, we'll come back to it uh, in a moment. I, I first want to um, welcome Elizabeth uh, to uh, our discussion as well. Um, Elizabeth, you represent Shell on this panel. Um, there, uh, Shell has put out a, a net zero uh, target uh, by 2050. Uh, you've also very recently uh, been um, addressed by a, a Dutch court uh, suggesting that maybe you weren't going fast enough uh, in your decarbonization pathway. I'd love to hear from you, uh, what are the steps that you're taking to reach your target of net zero emissions by, by 2050? How fast do you think you can go in, in the 2020s? Uh, and what's the role of your collaboration with your clients, the likes of ArcelorMittal, uh, on that journey? Uh, thank you, Faustine, and, and again, and, and Anthony and Nigel and Adit, it's just a pleasure to be part of this panel today. I'm going to start with the last part of your question, which is about collaboration. It is exactly being able to partner with global leading companies such as Asar Mittal and actually deliver because you can't, as an energy company, you can't accelerate without somewhere to sell your green solutions. And so it's the it's this meeting together between supply and demand balance that helps us really accelerate. So on the renewable side, many, many global big brands that you recognize, whether it's Microsoft or Amazon on the big superscalar cloud companies, all the way through other industrial companies who've signed up for the RE100, those commitments to go to 100% renewables then open the door for big renewables at scale. Because solar has been happening for a long time, but it was really a big company, a big industrial company like, like Shell has a specialization in scale. And so it's precisely this alignment where you see um, policy. So for example, building on what Audit said, it's essential that we have carbon pricing so you can have differentiation and that you can also have a level playing field and also allow innovation through technology neutrality. 
I'm from California, so I will use California as an example, is that we actually led the world, and I was had the privilege of being part of that, is of establishing the world's first carbon market when we passed the landmark legislation of AB 32 back in the early 2000s. Now, everybody said, oh, no, 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 that was going to potentially kill the economy and drive out industry from California. Well, at that time, California was the eighth largest economy in the world after we led with AB 32, the Renewable Portfolio Standard and landmark climate legislation. Lo and behold, California passed the UK and became the fifth largest GDP in the world, proving as a fact that you can actually set very aggressive carbon goals and environmental and renewable targets, et cetera, and actually create huge uplift for your economy if you align the right balance. And so it's all about that supply demand balance. So for example, we have a partnership in, with Toyota, with Shell in California, and we just set the world's record for the amount of hydrogen provided to transportation vehicles across light duty and trucks in the world. So that acceleration is possible when you create an ecosystem that aligns that because we're listed companies, we're commercial entities. And so we have to be able, you can produce green products. If you have nowhere to go, you can't do it. And that is the story of hydrogen, for example. I'm um, in my previous company back in the day, in that early 2000s, I actually installed the world's first hydrogen fueling station on the planet, but there was no, there were no vehicles to, you know, to take the hydrogen. So, so that's a great story because uh, there was policy incentive. We as an energy company could provide the supply and, and produce it, but there were no vehicles to buy it. And so then when we learned that lesson and we went into partnership with Toyota, we aligned the supply and demand so that as they brought the Mirai vehicles into, into the market, we were producing more. And then you build the, and then you have economic transformation. So it goes back to something that Nigel said that's so important for systems change you need the government support to create an ecosystem that enables all the actors to align and do the right thing commercially, create that pull through. And you also need to make sure that you have that timing so that you can actually begin to build and transform your economy. And California is an example of how you can do that with great GDP results. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. And that connects very well with what Aditya was saying around really mobilizing customers uh, to uh, get interested uh, and uh, buy uh, that green steel, uh, zero carbon steel uh, th that you were talking about, Aditya. I, I want to turn back to you. Uh, we, we really see that there is a full chain of offtake agreements, basically, that is required all the way from the end consumer to your automotive manufacturer, for instance, uh, who would have to commit and buy uh, uh, new forms of steel for, from, from an ArcelorMittal, and then an ArcelorMittal uh, would have a demand for new forms of energy from a shell. This whole chain that, that we've described in, in several reports, including the one launched today, um, is difficult to put in place. And some of that can be done on a voluntary basis, which you were saying earlier, those companies that currently buy zero carbon steel, uh, I suppose are doing it on a voluntary basis. Uh, but at some point, you need to shift to regular so how do you see that balance? How far can we go with, with those voluntary agreements? And when do you need a policy making to actually kick off to create that bigger market at a bigger scale? Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Faustine, and thank you, Elizabeth, for all your remarks. You, you're absolutely right. Today, it's it's on a voluntary basis. I think it's experimental. We have very limited quantities. It's it's certified uh, as being uh, net zero, uh, and and clearly, our customers are trying to understand what is their customers' uh, interest and in, in offtake. So, you're absolutely right. In terms of uh, uh, my my thought process or, or how we see it developing, I, I think the first news is that we have been actually surprised by the level of interest. So we did not think this early on uh, when, uh, as you mentioned, there is no regulatory support or policy support on green steel. There is no car marketing which has seen that this is green steel, yet the customers are already experimenting. Uh, and this goes back to Nigel's point, I think that we're reaching a tipping point and there is a movement to accelerate. So I think it's all positive. 
based on the conversations we are having, we can see that there will be policy support, especially for infrastructure uh, projects, which are government funded or government support, that they would be requiring some sort of low carbon steel or certified green steel or recycled renewable steel and, and, and uh, all of those products. I think eventually uh, uh, I look at this as uh, if you're talking about cars, you know, in the olden days when you bought a car, the aircon was an option. Right. So at some point in time, uh, you know, a more sustainable car will be like an option and some people will pay an extra for it. But in due course, that will become standardized. Right. So I'm not going to sit here and predict when that would be, but I think that will become standardized. And, and I think the policy uh, policy support would accelerate standardization. Uh, so uh, so I think the free market is working. Clearly, it will only last with some measure of policy support and obviously with the final consumer demand. One of the measures that is being discussed currently in Europe and in other regions uh, to establish that level playing field is a carbon border adjustment. Um, I'd be keen to hear, uh, Aditya, what, what you think about it and then Elizabeth, whether you think that this type of tool would also help a company like Shell in, in that transition. Aditya, maybe first? Okay, sure. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I, I think the key, the key message is level playing field. Whether that's a carbon border adjustment uh, or, or funding uh, support uh, in the uh, European level as we transition to a uniform ETS system globally, that's all up for discussion. Right. Today, there's a carbon price, i.e. a carbon cost to producing steel in Europe that needs to be rectified. Uh, and maybe the solution is that others have a similar ETS system. That's absolutely fine. Then you don't need a, a border adjustment. But till we, we arrive at that point, either our carbon costs are reinvested in our decarbonization initiatives. So at least then we feel economically we are whole. Uh, uh, and if that's not happening, then clearly you need some sort of border support. Because I, I think we all know what happens if there is no level playing field, right? Our costs are high, higher, we have the technology solution, but then the steel will be produced in a country which has a worse carbon footprint, exported uh, to Europe, again, more emissions. So at the end of the day, less steel in, in Europe and actually more global emissions. So no one wins in, in such a, a scenario. So creating the level f uh, playing field will be uh, will be critical. It will allow us to continue to innovate because we have tremendous R&D capability. Uh, I mean, you would think the steel industry doesn't have R&D, but we have a lot of R&D. We actually spend $300 million a year on research and development. So there's a lot of technology solutions and product solutions that we can provide the market. But for that, there has to be a level playing field. And so that's same question to you. How does a border carbon adjustment fit into the broader policy framework that you would need to progress? And if I can squeeze a second question after that, one of the key drivers to reduce the cost also for ArcelorMittal and others is to reduce the cost of the energy input, the renewable energy, renewable power, renewable hydrogen, etc. So how can you as an energy producer also help those energy intensive industries access lower cost renewable energy to produce green products at a lower cost as well. Uh, thank you, Fastine. Just so you know, for the technical folks at the World Economic Forum, it's very difficult to hear you. So I'm leaning in trying to capture uh, what you said, but it's uh, I don't know if it's on my computer end or um, for on your end, but very, very difficult to hear and kind of coming in and out. So just maybe the folks in the background can do a sound check. <laughs> so I, I think uh, I'm going to start with the, the, the question on carbon. One of the things that Shell has been discussing for quite a while in our policy framework is important for carbon pricing, and that builds into what Audit said so eloquently about a level playing field. Because we need to make sure, if you think about Europe and the context of regional economies, you need to create virtuous systems that enable the decarbonization at pace and acceleration, and, and really believe that the positive incentives are what's going to drive the, drive the pull through, both from the demand and the supply side. It's very, very important. And that goes back to why I use the California example as well. Um, because it created that positive ecosystem that then drives the change by having economic levers 
that actually are incentives of the right behavior in the right direction so that companies can actually make an economic, and then the economics begin to work. Uh, and so then you see, for example, coal is a great example, is that coal has left the power system because of economics. And so it is, you know, renewables actually are driving the spark spread. They're market pricing in many, many different markets now, which is a great thing. And so that's how it shows you when you have that alignment, actually um, the free market works in the right direction, which is quite exciting, which goes to your question about lower price of energy. So one of the things that's really important is actually creating a certainty of an investment path. Because when you think about large assets at scale, uh, apologies, that's at my end. My neighbor has started construction. <laughs> Welcome to working from home in COVID, so apologies to everyone. I uh, hope you can still hear me. In any case, what's really important is actually that alignment of investment certainty because at scale projects, whether it's a big offshore wind farm or a green hydrogen electrolyzer at scale, like Shell has invested with our HKN wind farm here in the Netherlands, and then what we're doing with the port of Rotterdam, that's a very, very large system. Those are, those are like, that collectively will be an over $5 billion plus investment in capital by Shell in that single project. And so th these are magnitudes of millions of dollars, which is billions of dollars rather, which is where a big balance sheet company like Shell comes in because we have to move on scale. And that's where investment certainty and vehicles from the government policy come into effect because you build a huge wind farm, you know, 700, 800 megawatts or larger, big electrolyzers, 200 megawatts or larger. These are big industrial projects that have lifetime of 20 plus, you know, 30, 40 years of useful life. And therefore, you, want you need that investment certainty of that path. And then that, in other words, then begins to create the, the price efficiency um, as those projects come in line. And it goes back to also that, again, that systems effect. In order to do that, we also have to make sure that you have a transmission network in Europe that can take on more electrons into the grid. We need to make sure that we're also creating policy. And this is something great that the Netherlands and Germany has done collectively is saying, yeah, we can reutilize gas infrastructure for hydrogen injection. That also then begins to lower the cost so that we're taking the assets that we have and transforming them in a positive manner for systems effect. And so these are the things that come together that begin to lower the cost so that when Audit and I talk about working together, we can say, yeah, we can actually invest together. We can lower the cost and provide that mutual certainty on that pathway to green hydrogen, in this case, um, green steel. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. And um, I'm sorry I have uh, apparently lost visual, but hopefully you can still hear me or even uh, hear me better than before. Uh, I'd love to turn back to uh, Aditya uh, to better understand how those collaborations can be put in place uh, with um, your energy providers um, to really um, help with innovation. We know that there's a number of techno new technologies that, that need to be developed, uh, hydrogen-based, carbon capture-based, you, you mentioned earlier, um, for to bring primary steel technologies to market. Um, how are you accelerating that innovation process uh, as uh, a steel manufacturer? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Faustine. I think by talking to people like Elizabeth, we are accelerating our process because we're actually uh, figuring out how can we use hydrogen in our existing processes. So we have a pilot in, in Germany, in Hamburg, where uh, we, we want to, we are using hydrogen today and understand what it does to the properties of steel. But just coming back to the broader uh, point on uh, energy, hydrogen, and CCS, uh, I think when we look at the energy space today, renewable price is attractive, so it's not unattractive, right? Because we get it at the same price as other forms of electricity. Uh, the, the whole drive to bring down renewable cost is really to make hydrogen much more competitive. Because at today's cost of uh, power, hydrogen is very expensive, at least for our, our business. 
And so that's why this whole discussion, can we bring hydrogen down to one and a half euro uh, uh, per kilo relative to maybe three to four euros where it's sitting today based on the energy cost? And that would basically mean energy costs have to reduce by 70% or something like that. So that is that is clearly a path that we're moving forward. And, and that's why all of Elizabeth's points were excellent. How can we use existing infrastructure? How can we provide policy certainty to make that happen? And we've seen in the past that as you invest, you learn, you develop IP, you develop capability, and costs come down. Nevertheless, I think we should not ignore the fact that in case costs remain elevated for a period of time, that there is a very strong role uh, of CCU and CCS. And, and Elizabeth talked about this as well. And we see it in our business where we we can use natural gas, existing renewable power, but with CCU, CCS, we can achieve the same net zero outcome without necessarily relying on hydrogen. So if hydrogen prices come down, fantastic. That's a, a solution that we have. But in case it takes longer, there should also be policy support, uh, technology support, uh, R&D attention to different CCU and, and CCS projects. So we're doing both. As, as I mentioned, we're using hydrogen. But uh, as I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, we also have a very interesting CCU project in Belgium uh, where we take the off gases and we actually have bacteria, <laughs> microbes, which eat the off gases and convert it into advanced bio, uh, biofuels. Thanks a lot, Aditya. Um, we are slowly but surely uh, heading towards the end of this uh, session. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, before we do a closing round, uh, I want to uh, ask you, uh, what do you expect uh, can uh, be done by governments uh, to um, also help you through that transition? Uh, and how do you also expect the finance players to play into that uh, steel decarbonization story and more broadly the decarbonization of heavy industry? Thank you, Faustine. It's good to hear you and see you back. <laughs> yes, so the, the role of finance is absolutely in, essential because one of the, it's not just about capital. Actually, there's plenty of capital that is hungry to move into the net zero space, which is fantastic. So that's the other portion of collaboration is how do we partnership, how do we have partners with banks, other infra funds and so forth who are interested in infrastructure and these green and net zero projects. So that's very, very exciting. But I think the really, really important and tough aspect of finance that is really needed is this area of sustainability finance that looks at risk. Because ultimately, from a commercial perspective, if I have to run to my RDS board and get approval for a project, I've got to answer to a commercial IRR return. And part of how you factor in your IRR return is you have to, you have to manage risk and you want your risk and return aligned. And so it's the fundamentals of finance that then now, as we think about the energy transition and acceleration, how do we actually look at risk differently and therefore to give the confidence to be, to be actually drive higher returns in areas such as renewables that currently have lower return because they're viewed as low risk. And so, and so we have to, again, look for the levers that we can create virtuous pathways for acceleration. And that role of sustainable finance is absolutely essential. Bloomberg New Energy Finance talks about the missing money problem around renewables and everything to do with green, green hydrogen, et cetera. And that is also the case if you get into aviation fuel, sustainable aviation fuel, biofuels, et cetera. And so this is where policy and finance need to come together. And so, it was, Nigel, it was wonderful to hear about your work on that as well. Um, in, in the, with the mission possible, because it's essential to really drive all of those factors coming together so that you can make investment decisions that are gonna deliver commercial returns. Because again, to make the moves that we need to do in the next decade that are really going to have that impact and materiality for society, we need to do big scale. So it's, it's right now the exciting thing, technology is proven at the smaller scale, but to make the big scale leaps that we need. Uh, we need to have that financial lever lining up so that these projects really deliver commercial returns and in turn shareholder value, which then creates the virtuous circle for societal benefits. 
Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. I'm going to ask both of you the, the same last question to close uh, this discussion. Uh, COP26 is on the horizon in less than six months' time. Uh, we are collectively, through the Net Zero Still Initiative and with uh, our colleagues from, from the COP26 presidency and, and the Race to Zero High Level Champions, working to unlock that scale, uh, as you just described, Elizabeth. Uh, by COP. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you in a couple of sentences to close this discussion. Uh, how do you think we can really unlock that change by COP? Uh, what needs to happen for the steel sector decarbonization uh, to be accelerated um, before uh, the end of the year, or at least the ingredients to be in place for an acceleration in the following months? Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Elizabeth, and we'll close with uh, Aditya. Uh, thank you so much, Faustine. The key is breaking across silos. So while it's very, very important for financial institutions and banks to collaborate together, and while it's very important to have different sectors collaborate together, part of what is so exciting about today's conversation and where solution and innovation will happen is bringing commercial leaders such as ourselves together with the financial leaders, together with policymakers, we have to break down the previous silos because if you look at how policy and regulation is made, whether it's in the financial sector or the energy sector or steel, et cetera, it's all done in these narrow silos. And one of the best learnings from innovation out of Silicon Valley is that it's at the edge where things converge is where the magic happens. So my recommendation before COP is bring us together Let's break down the silos because that way someone like myself who's highly commercial, I can be with the right you know, financial people, with audit, with our customers. We're pulling it because it is exactly systems, supply chain, and breaking down those silos for real collaboration. That's going to move the needle. And the policymakers have to get out of their silos as well. And that's how we can help. Be very practical. Thank you. Aditya, same question to you. Uh, uh, thank you, Faustine. I think Elizabeth uh, captured a lot of the spirit. Uh, I guess my two comments, first of all, uh, I appreciate Nigel uh, participating in the panel. So I hope you learned something about the steel business and the steel industry. And, and hopefully that helps our industry as we decarbonize uh, through COP26. So I really thank him for his time and his participation. And, uh, and I think we talked about this earlier in the panel. Uh, for the steel industry, we have the technology solutions. We think we will have ready-made market. Uh, our customers we are very excited about the prospects. What we really need is policy support. So we need a level playing field. What form that comes, I mean, I leave to Nigel and, and uh, the rest of the teams, but it, maybe it's a carbon border adjustment, maybe it's uh, funding the transition, uh, or maybe it's some sort of ETS system on a global basis. But as soon as that is in place, then innovation will kick in. Uh, people are energized already, but they'll be even more energized to find the solutions. And I think we have the full acceleration of the decarbonization of steel sector. So anyway, uh, I know he probably has a lot of stuff on his plate already. So we're just adding to it, but I, I appreciate his support and his participation. Thank you very much to both. Uh, we are going to close this discussion here. There will be uh, much more to be said, but I think the directions you've laid out uh, are well noted both by uh, Nigel, who I see nodding on my screen, uh, as well as uh, ourselves as the Mission Possible Partnership to inform the work that we will be doing with you and with a lot of other players in the steel value chain uh, over the coming months. So thanks again for joining us today and apologies to the audience uh, for the technical glitches we had uh, today. It's all part of working from home uh, from different locations in the world. So hopefully you'll still have had an opportunity to follow this very good discussion. Uh, looking forward to the other panels this afternoon um, and um, looking forward to speaking to all of you soon. Thank you very much.